And I'll begin by introducing Shane. Um, our presenter this evening is uh, Shane Jordan, and he's a native Californian and a graduate student at Cal State Northridge, and has been interested in ecology and evolution of chaparral and desert biotic communities. Uh, his research includes the research, the uh, response of chaparral birds, can't talk tonight, chaparral birds to uh, wildlife and the biogeography of insular plant communities. Uh, he is currently studying the distribution of chaparral plants within desert mountains uh, to uh, characterize environmental influence on relic populations and patterns of community assembly where they occur in arid landscapes. And so this is his master's level research, the way I understand it. And uh, he's going to give us a presentation tonight on what he has found. So uh, Shane, if you will um, step forward and you can share your screen, we'll get going. Okay. I just wanna say first, thank you Snowdy for inviting me to talk to this group tonight. Uh, I think this is gonna be a, a good opportunity to share some of my research with people who are likewise interested in California native plants. So let's see, here is the presentation. Start the timer and pointer. Okay, so the topic at hand is microclimatic refugia of chaparral relics in mountains of the Mojave Desert. Now I understand this title comes with a little bit of jargon and hopefully throughout the course of my talk, uh, you become more familiar with what some of these uh, terms mean, specifically things like microclimatic refugia. Uh, and I'll talk a little bit about what chaparral is as well. So uh, here's just a brief outline of the talk. Uh, I'm, gonna, I'm gonna break it into three parts. So first I'll talk a bit about the natural history of climate relics in the Mojave Desert. I'll talk a bit about the field surveys that I've done and some of the interesting plants that I found in those surveys. And then I'll sort of close it out with um, an analysis and a discussion of the implications of some of the findings. And before I can really get into talking about natural history, uh, specifically California natural history, I want to recognize that this natural history really has another name. So I'll be talking about you know, different plant species using sort of our uh, Western botanical nomenclature. But you know, this is not the nomenclature that was necessarily uh, used before European settlers came to California. Uh, indigenous people had a, a pretty good understanding of California native plants for a long time before Western botanists came to this area. And I just wanna point at uh, some examples of these three publications. Um, from three different California indigenous groups that discuss California flora and discuss uh, not only different uses of these plants for these indigenous groups, but different names that these groups had for these plants. So despite the fact that I might call a plant by a scientific name, I'd like to recognize that California indigenous groups have uh, established other names for these plants uh, before we actually came up with the names that we use today. So we're going to talk about chaparral vegetation. And what is chaparral? Well, chaparral is this kind of uh, plant community that's pretty much characteristic of the Mediterranean climate biome. And if you don't know this, the Mediterranean climate biome only occurs in five different parts of the world. And you might notice from this map that it tends to occur at similar latitudes, both north and south of the equator. And in these different parts of the world, which include California and of course the Mediterranean and South America and South Africa and Southern Australia, people have different words for what we in California call chaparral, um, just so you know that. And basically what characterizes chaparral is that it's, uh, it's a type of vegetation that occurs in an area that has mild wet winters and warm dry summers. And the plants that occur in these areas are generally adapted to seasonal drought. So they're typically receiving rainfall during one period of the year, which is usually the winter. 
And these plant communities are generally composed of what we would call sclerophyllous plants. And sclerophyllous plants are plants that have really thick leaves that are basically desiccation and wilt resistant. And um, the most iconic genus to the, uh, of the Mediterranean climate biome is the genus Quercus, which is the genus of oaks. You're probably familiar with that. Uh, Quercus agrifolia here is one of our local native oaks that you've probably seen before. But of course, there are many, many other species of oak that occur uh, not just in California, but in other Mediterranean climate biomes. So what about chaparral in the desert? I mean, that's kind of a strange story because we know the desert is not a Mediterranean climate biome. Well, I first heard about this in this book here called uh, A Visitor's Guide to Mojave National Preserve by Sherry Ray and John McKinney. And in this book, they describe the plant communities of a place called Carruthers Canyon, which is out in Mojave National Preserve. And they talked about the occurrence of what they describe in the book as coastal chaparral in these sort of uh, pinyon juniper woodlands within sort of upper elevation regions of um, the New York mountains in Mojave National Preserve. And I thought that, that was pretty fascinating. So after that, I finally had the chance to visit this place on several occasions and with a little bit of time and generating some knowledge about botany, I started to uh, survey vegetation and, and learn the plants of this area. And indeed, there are some unusual plant occurrences that you could find in this environment. So what's the story with the chaparral in the desert? Well, the chaparral taxa that we find in the Mojave Desert today, uh, it turns out that they're climate relics and they have much more widespread distribution in what are actually distant floristic provinces. And specifically, I would point toward the California floristic province and what we would call the Madrean floristic province or the Madrean pine oak woodlands. And we can kind of get a sense of, this is what Chaparral in the California floristic province looks like here. This is the San Bernardino mountains. And this is a sort of picture of what Chaparral looks like in the Madrean floristic province or near the Madrean floristic province. They look uh, like remarkably similar types of plant communities. And it, as it turns out, species from these plant communities do occur here in the Mojave Desert beyond those regions. So I'll talk just a little bit about these two uh, floristic provinces. So the California floristic province, it's sort of classically a Mediterranean type climate biome, which is broken up into these various subsections that you may or may not be familiar with. And basically the California floristic province includes ecosystems that are characterized again by sclerophyllous plant species. These are plants with thick leaves that are desiccation resistant, that are also adapted to seasonal drought, which is typically in the summer. Um, you may or may not know that the California floristic province is characterized by exceptionally high plant diversity. It's actually considered a biodiversity hotspot. And it's characterized by uh, some pretty remarkable endemism. That is, there are many, many species of plants that only occur in the California floristic province naturally and nowhere else on earth. And as it turns out, there are disjunct or sort of isolated populations that are associated with this coastal chaparral. Uh, that are found in just a few of the pinyon juniper woodlands that we have here in the Mojave Desert. So that's kind of interesting. Madrean floristic province, on the other hand, uh, extends from Mexico up into what is called the Apachean Sky Islands, kind of on the edge of the southwestern deserts, mostly in Arizona. Um, and these ecosystems also include sclerophyllous vegetation, although they do not have a Mediterranean climate. They are instead characterized more by summer precipitation and generally warmer uh, annual temperatures. Uh, but again, as it turns out, taxa that are associated with the Madrean interior chaparral, as it's called, also occur in these woodlands found within the Mojave Desert. So if you look at this figure on the bottom left, we can see sort of California and Nevada and, and Arizona here. And this is where the Apachean um, section of the Madrean floristic province sort of extends all the way up to meet the Mojave Desert. So the occurrence of these types of species in the Mojave Desert is, is really exceptional. We can think of you know, our typical chaparral here in the local San Gabriel Mountains, and we can compare that to chaparral in a place like the New York Mountains in the Mojave Desert. And indeed, there are some similarities between these plant communities, but it's still a really exceptional uh, phenomenon to have chaparral, especially isolated populations of chaparral, sort of way out in the middle of the desert. 
And so one of the big, big questions is, well, what are these populations doing there? It doesn't seem to make sense. Well, answer that question, basically we kind of need to look at paleoclimate. And what we know about paleoclimate is that um, about 12 to 14,000 years ago during the late Pleistocene, the climate of California was much different than it is today. And what we know is that it was a period of increased rainfall in the region that is presently occupied by the Mojave Desert. And what is theorized is that the average storm track coming off the Pacific Ocean, um, basically this is the jet stream um, coming down from, from the uh, Pacific Northwest, uh, that that storm track was about five degrees further south in latitude than it presently is today. Um, and so that caused this area that is presently the Mojave Desert to get a lot more rainfall than it does now. Uh, and of course, this storm track has, is now kind of teased to go further north than that at the present. So that's one interesting thing. What we also know is that woodlands that were dominated by oaks and junipers and pines were probably much more widespread across this landscape at that time. How do we know that? Well, uh, research researchers who are pretty intuitive have uh, collected data from wood rat middens. If you don't know anything about wood rats, wood rats are rodents that occur in, in uh, the Mojave region that like to go around and gather plant materials and they bring them back to their den and pile them up. And it's kind of odd, but what wood rats do is when they're done with the vegetation that they collected, they will urinate on it. And with time, especially in an arid environment, the urine will cause that plant material to fossilize and it will preserve it for extremely long periods of time. Um, this is what's called a midden series here in this image. And a typical midden series could go back as far as 60,000 years. So that's how long some of this fossilized plant material could be preserved in a wood rat midden. And on this figure, we have these uh, four different genera, Abies, which is uh, the, the genus of firs, Juniperus, the genus of junipers, Pinus, the genus of pines, and Quercus, the genus of oaks. And these bars in this figure represent the frequency at which those genera occurred in this particular midden series at particular phases in time that uh, the material was dated to which by the way, uh, they used radiocarbon dating to figure out how old this midden material is. And what I would point to, which is highlighted with this uh, red rectangle, is that the, gener the genera of Abies and Juniperus and Pinus and Quercus were all apparently much more widespread in uh, this landscape, uh, something like 10 to 15 to 20,000 years ago than they are at present, which is where the number zero is. Uh, they're, of course, absent from a lot of these middens now. And this particular midden site was a low elevation midden site. And so this is an area that today is uh, populated by plants that are much more characteristic of the desert, things like cactus, for example, creosote growth. So anyway, we have evidence to show that some of these woodland species were much more widespread during this time that we also know there was probably a lot more rainfall, which makes sense. And particularly in the Mojave Desert, we have some pretty good data on the distribution of the genus Quercus, the genus of oaks, again, using uh, information from wood rat middens. And what the data shows us is not only is there a very tight correlation between the distribution of oaks and the distribution of wood rats, which is kind of what this map is trying to illustrate, but that if when looking at the wood rat midden series and dating it over time, we can see how the distribution of Quercus has likely contracted over the last 8,000 years. So let's say at that point in time, 8,000 years ago, the genus Quercus was present within the Mojave Desert region at an elevation of approximately 900 meters. By 3,500 years ago, the genus Quercus was distributed at an elevation mainly above 1,200 meters. And we know at present that the genus Quercus is not found any lower pretty much than the elevation of 1400 meters. And so there's pretty good evidence yet again to show that uh, woodland species such as oaks uh, once were more widespread, but have slowly been contracting their range within the area that is presently the Mojave Desert. And so today, 
or presently, these woodland species are restricted to isolated refugia, which typically occur at higher elevation microsites, as we were kind of just looking at. And again, these in include things like the canyon live oak. This, by the way, is a specimen from Carruthers Canyon in the New York Mountains within Mojave National Preserve. And you can see for perspective, this guy standing next to it. This is quite an impressive tree growing in the desert. It's pretty interesting. Uh, things like single leaf pinion pine, Pinus monophylla, also are associated with these kinds of communities. Um, in addition, things like Utah juniper uh, are associated with these kinds of communities. And probably the most extreme example of climate relics in the Mojave Desert would be Abies conchlor, the white fir, which occurs in some extremely small populations within, I believe, just three mountain ranges in the Mojave Desert, which is the New York Mountains, the Clark Range, and the Kingston Range. And I'll show you a map of those places in a moment. But um, to find white fur in the Mojave Desert is, is a pretty, uh, not only is it exceptional, but it's a pretty interesting piece of evidence to suggest that this climate was different at one time. So another thing we know is that summer rainfall in the Mojave region has, has really fluctuated a lot since the Pleistocene ended. And if you look at this plot, we're looking at you know, rainfall from the four seasons of the year. The summer rainfall is shown with this sort of solid black line here. And so I would, I would point your attention mainly to the summer rainfall. And the dashed red line here at 12,000 years ago sort of represents the end of the Pleistocene. And zero here on the x-axis would represent the present. And of course, on the y-axis, we have the presentation, uh, precipitation. And so this summer rainfall has fluctuated quite a bit since the Pleistocene ended. And at present, it's not quite as high as it once was something like 10,000 years ago. So that's kind of interesting. What about this summer rainfall? Well, first of all, we know that precipitation increases with elevation. That's kind of a, you know, a physical fact, uh, a physiographic fact. Um, and we also have evidence here to suggest that not only does precipitation increase with elevation, but precipitation in the Mojave Desert appears to also increase with eastern longitude. Uh, and particularly, I use the 116 degree longitude level as a marker, but this map on the left is showing you 15 mountain ranges within the Mojave Desert. Some of them are kind of on the periphery of the Mojave, but they still include Mojavean elements. These are the 15 mountain ranges in the Mojave Desert where chaparral species still occur today. And you'll probably notice that most of them occur east of 116 degrees longitude. That's kind of interesting. What's going on east of 116 degrees longitude? Well, probably the influence of the North American monsoon. Plot on the right here is again showing us how not only does precipitation increase significantly with elevation, but precipitation is increasing significantly with that eastern longitude. So there might be something going on with these plants occurring not only in upper elevation sites that get more rainfall, but in sites that are further east that re are receiving summer rainfall, in effect, receiving what we would call bimodal precipitation. So these spots are probably getting some rainfall in the winter, kind of like the Mediterranean climate region, but they're also probably getting some rainfall in the summer, which might provide a little bit of relief from that seasonal drought that's characteristic of, you know, more Mediterranean type chaparral. So that is another interesting thing that we know. So this kind of has led to my focal research questions, and there are four of them. So basically, I intended to answer, or I intended to ask, how is it that climatic and topographic factors influence the distribution of relic chaparral species across an arid environment? Are there any patterns that we can find in the co-occurrence of chaparral, woodland, and desert plant assemblages? that all seem to be mixed up together in these places. Three, how similar are the floras of the mountain ranges where chaparral species occur across the Mojave Desert? And lastly, and maybe this is, this is kind of one of the most important things, can it be predicted that future climate change will influence the availability of suitable habitat for these taxa? So to set out and answer these questions, the first thing 
that one would have to do is go out to the field, go out to some of these mountain ranges and find some of these plants. So I'll transition into talking about my field surveys. So in order to kind of set up a study system to answer those questions, I chose eight target species that are that have known relic occurrences within the Mojave Desert and selected them for survey. I noticed someone asked in the chat what a relic is, so I, I can just answer that now. A relic is something that, as I kind of just said, is a in, in terms of plants anyway, a relic plant population would be, you know, a group of plants that were once much more widespread on the landscape had a much larger population size, but today they have a very, very small sort of restricted population size. So that's kind of what a relic is. So all of these species that I've selected uh, tend to have pretty small populations in the Mojave Desert. So the eight species were Ramnus elicifolia, Parcus chrysolepis, Arctostaphylos pungens, Frangela californica. You might be familiar with some of these plants. They're pretty characteristically chaparral-like species, sort of iconic in some ways. Um, the other four were Ruth aromatica, Ceanothus palsiflorus, Brachalia californica, and Garia flavescens. So all eight of these species have a fairly widespread occurrence in both the California floristic province and the Madrean floristic province, but they also have these really isolated occurrences in relatively small populations within the Mojave Desert. So those are the eight study species. The next question was, well, how to find them? So I first looked at herbarium records from the California Consortium Herbarium Database. And if you've ever looked at Cal Flora, you've probably seen one of these sort of uh, distribution record maps. And so this is an example of a distribution record map for Quercus chrysolepis, the canyon live oak. And this is kind of showing where Quercus chrysolepis occurs in the San Bernardino Mountains and also out in Mojave National Preserve. I also looked at some research grade observation on the website iNaturalist, which you may be familiar with. Likewise, this is data for Quercus chrysolepis. And this information um, is pretty good at providing, you know, detailed coordinates and location uh, information about where it is you can find these plants. And this kind of quickly starts to turn into an Easter egg hunt, if you can imagine, uh, just because someone documented a plant in a particular place at some point in time doesn't mean it's going to be that easy to find. So these surveys in, involved quite a bit of you know, driving around, hiking around, searching around, and, and finding good places to conduct surveys. How did I do these surveys? Or rather, where did I do these surveys? Um, they were replicated in six mountain ranges across the Mojave Desert. So I chose the San Gabriel Mountains, the San Bernardino Mountains, which are kind of in the transition zone between the California Floristic Province and the Mojave Desert. I chose the Granite Mountains, the New York Mountains, and the Clark Range, which are sort of these isolated mountain ranges within really the center of the Mojave Desert. And then the Hualapai Mountains in at the extreme end of the eastern Mojave Desert, um, where the Mojave Desert kind of starts to transition into that Apachean section of the Madrean Floristic Province that I was talking about. And so we kind of have this whole landscape scale approach to studying the distribution of these chaparral taxa. The numbers in these circle, uh, circles represent the number of surveys that were done in each mountain range. So it's uh, 41 surveys that were done in total. And I will also point, uh, point at the fact I, I chose these mountain ranges and chose to survey the sites in them just simply because of their accessibility. There, of course, are other places I could have gone to survey these plants. Um, but a lot of them were just not practical to get to. So the method used survey vegetation was something called a belt transect. And these transects were 50 meters long and one meter wide. And so this illustration here kind of shows what a typical belt transect might have looked like across uh, you know, an area of vegetation. They were typically as straight as possible like this. And within the 50 by one meter belt transect, I measured the proportional cover of all living vegetation that was either a tree, a shrub, or a subshrub. Now I recognize that there were occasionally forbs and grasses in these places, and I did record them, but uh, none of that data got implemented into my analyses. So the, mainly the focus here is looking at trees, shrubs, and subshrubs. And this is kind of what one of those transects looks like. 
Uh, this is in the Hualapai Mountains. Here's another example of what one of those transects looks like in the Granite Mountains. And I will also note that not only did I survey this vegetation, but I spent you know, a fair amount of time thinking about making plant collections. And so I frequently, frequently returned from these places with a plant press loaded full of specimens, which went into the herbarium at Cal State Northridge. And so we have a record of not just the chaparral plants that I was interested in studying, but other plants of interest that occurred in these areas. So there's something like a hundred different plant specimens that I collected that have, have gone into the herbarium to provide a, you know, a voucher uh, and a record of, of what was found at these places at the time that I was there. So I'll just kind of give you a little bit of a tour through what some of these places look like. This is the San Gabriel Mountains, which might be the most familiar of all these mountain ranges to this audience. Uh, and this is what you would call the transmontane slopes of the San Gabriel Mountains or the desert facing side of the, of the San Gabriel Mountains. And this is an example of a plant community where the desert is transitioning into chaparral, which actually pretty quickly transi transitions into woodland. And you can see in this picture, we have Arctostaphylos, the manzanita right here, but right next to the Arctostaphylos is Pinus melophila, pinion pine, uh, which is a characteristic desert tree. So it's kind of odd to see chaparral and, and pinion pine co-occurring in the San Gabriel Mountains, but they do. Uh, also Hespero yucca there in the background. Uh, other plants that you could find in this area include things like Ceanothus palsiflorus and things like Frangula californica. Again, kind of typical um, chaparral associated with the California floristic province. In the San Bernardino Mountains, things are a little bit different. Again, this is uh, an area where the desert, the Mojave Desert is transitioning into sort of more chaparral and woodland. You can see we have again, Pinus monophylla, but also Yucca brevifolia, the Joshua tree, things like ephedra. There was also Ceanothus palsiflorus at this site. So a really interesting combination of vegetation that is found in some of these areas. Um, also things like woodlands of Quercus chrysolepis, the Canyon Live Oak, uh, were places that I surveyed. This is also on the desert facing slopes of the San Bernardino Mountains, even though it doesn't look anything like the desert. And things like Garia flavescens, the uh, ashy silk tassel. Um, these, were, these were things that were found in the San Bernardino Mountains. Perhaps less familiar might be the Granite Mountains. And part of the reason why the Granite Mountains might be less familiar is that uh, a lot of this mountain range is owned by the University of California and it's off limits to public access. So I was granted public access by the uh, Granite Mountains Reserve people and uh, able, I was allowed to go into some places like this and, and survey vegetation. Uh, as you might see from this picture, surveying vegetation in the Granite Mountains was extremely challenging. This is not an easy environment to walk around in, to hike around in. In fact, it's, it's more like you're climbing around in it. Uh, let alone an environment to string up a 50 meter transect. Um, but with some help, I got it done. You can see my, my tape going through a, a patchy area of, pin, of uh, Pinus monophylla and Quercus chrysolepis here, sort of a pine oak woodland. Uh, and then some areas like this where it was maybe more forgiving where you had species like uh, Cylindropuntia. Again, just more uh, sort of rocky terrain. Some of the noteworthy plants that you could find in the Granite Mountains include things like Ariodictyon and Angustifolium, which is a 2B.3 um, ranked plant, which means it's a threatened plant in California. Um, again, things like Quercus chrysolepis, which I will note has some pretty exceptionally small populations in the Granite Mountains. Uh, groves of this tree that I sampled included maybe five trees. And that's it. So, you know, this is something that people should be keeping their eyes on, especially in a in a climate change scenario. And then things like um, Rhamnus elicifolia, which the populations were a little bit bigger than than those of Quercus chrysolepis, but I would point out that Rhamnus elicifolia in the Granite Mountains, oddly, is typically found in these cracks in between boulders and really nowhere else. So this it's kind of odd that it has this this funny little niche where it just grows in these cracks and rocks. Uh, so that's kind of interesting. New York mountains uh, look something like this. And yet again, we have some woodlands of oaks, uh, more than five in this case. These, these populations are, you know, seem to be larger and, and you know, more well-established. 
And again, in the New York mountains, you can find things like Rhamnus alyssifolia and C. anothus palsiflorus. And uh, these are chaparral species, characteristic, again, of these distant floristic provinces. You come out of the desert and all of a sudden you're in this environment where you're finding these plants. It's, it's kind of odd. In the New York mountains, there are some other noteworthy plants that you can find, things like Alias cirlzii, uh, things like Fracera albomarginata, which is also a threatened plant. Uh, another really interesting example of a, of a species, or rather a hybrid species that you can find in the New York mountains, is this cross between Pinus monophylla and Pinus edulis. Pinus monophylla is the single leaf pinion pine, Pinus edulis is the Colorado pinion pine, and both species occur in the New York mountains, but they also meet at a hybrid zone there. And if you know anything about those two pines, Pinus monophylla, as its scientific name suggests, it's the single leaf pinion. So its uh, needles are limited to clusters of one, whereas Pinus edulis has needles clustered in groups of two. Well, in the hybrids, you can find needles in clusters of one and two on the same plant, which if you look carefully at this picture, you can see that. So that's kind of an interesting thing. And then things like Berberus hemotocarpa. Uh, this is a, a, um, a species that's kind of more characteristic of the Madrean floristic, floristic province, but does find its way into California uh, in the New York mountains, which is kind of interesting. The Clark Range is kind of another story. And in the Clark Range, again, the chaparral populations that can be found there are exceptionally small. And the environments where that chaparral occurs tend to be kind of extreme. This is a place called Bighorn Canyon, um, which is kind of uh, near Mountain Pass, where I-15 makes its way from Baker to Las Vegas. And in here, you can find populations of Garia flavescens. Again, probably less than 10 plants of Garia flavescens that I found when I was up there. Uh, this is on the upper right, the canyon above a place called Pachalka Spring, where you can find exceptionally small populations of Garia flavescens, you can kind of see here in the middle, and also exceptionally small populations of Frangula californica. In fact, the only place I found Frangula californica in the entire Clark Range was in this canyon, and there were about three plants. So that's kind of interesting. And then uh, here's kind of on the north side of the Clark Range, where Garia flavescens occurs kind of down and more in the, the highland desert scrub along with Yucca baccata and, and Cylindra puntia. And there were a handful of these Garia flavescence plants found there, but a lot of them didn't look very good when I was there. Uh, I don't know if you can tell from this picture on the bottom right, but some of them appeared to be dying or at least uh, dealing with a lot of drought stress. So that's interesting. Some of the noteworthy plants that you can find in the Clark Range include things like Tragia ramosa, again, another threatened plant species, ranked 4.3, uh, at least threatened within California. Things like agave utahensis, again, a species threatened in California. Uh, things like uh, agaritina herbacea, again, another plant species threatened in California. And things like Areogonum hermonii, all of which plants uh, that barely make it into the state of California, but they can be found in these mountain ranges in pretty small numbers. So that's kind of interesting too. In the Hualapai Mountains, the story is much different. You're probably noticing that this kind of looks more like the mountains of California. Maybe this looks like the San Jacinto Mountains or something, or the San Gabriels. So chaparral is much more abundant in the Hualapai Mountains, and we might attribute that to summer rainfall. But here we can find things like Arctostaphylos pungens, and a species of Cercocarpus that does not occur in California, which is Cercocarpus montana. So you might be familiar with Cercocarpus betuloides or Letifolius that we have pretty commonly in our mountains here. Well, if you go to the Hualapai Mountains, you can find Cercocarpus montana. And some of the other noteworthy plants you can find in these mountains are things like Aquatia ritii and Fendlera rupicola and Ceanothus fendleri. None of these three species occur in California at all. Um, but they do occur on the edge of the Mojave Desert in the Hualapai Mountains. And it's interesting to see that the genus Ceanothus, which we think of as being so characteristic of the California floristic province, uh, includes a species that doesn't occur in California when you go to Arizona. Uh, there's also Glandularia gudingii, which does just barely make it into California, but it's pretty common in the Hualapai Mountains. And I would like to point out that this plant, which is an herb, uh, was in flower in October. <laughs> 
Now, whole populations of these plants were in, were in flower in October. And you might think, hmm, why would that be? Well, perhaps these plants were responding to summer precipitation due to the North American monsoon in the Hualapai Mountains. Uh, and they started to flower in fall, which is kind of odd. So those are kind of some of the highlights from the field surveys. Um, I'll move into talking about analysis. A little bit of discussion. Bear with me because some of this does get a tad bit technical and I'll try to break it down for you in a way that's uh, digestible. So remember that I said one of the research objectives was to understand how topographic and climatic factors are influencing the distribution of these plants. So after going out and collecting all this proportional cover data from all these sites, I went back and started doing some GIS modeling using what are called digital elevation models right, in order to generate data about the topography of the sites where I surveyed vegetation. And so I basically um, was able to quantify uh, the elevation, the slope, that is how steep the area was, the aspect, that is which direction the area faced, and two metrics that are likely unfamiliar, topographic position index and terrain wetness index. And basically, topographic position index is a measure of where does a site lie on the mountain. And so it gives you this value from some negative number to some positive number. And the more negative the value, the more the site is associated with being in a depression or a canyon bottom. Um, values near zero kind of indicate mid slopes and really high positive values indicate ridges or mountaintops. And so this is just kind of getting an idea, of, well, what part of the mountain are these sites positioned at? which can tell you something about you know, where these plants tend to occur. Terrain wetness index is um, another index that kind of gets you at an understanding of what is the likelihood that a site is going to accumulate groundwater. And this value basically goes from zero to some positive number. And the more and more positive that value, the more and more the likelihood that the site is going to accumulate groundwater. You can kind of see here where, the, where the, the green is, this is like a canyon bottom the higher probability of accumulating groundwater than slopes and peaks. I also pulled biologically meaningful climate variables from what's known as the World Clim Database. You may have heard it, of it or not. And these, um, these metrics I pulled were you know, minimum and maximum annual mean temperature, summer precipitation, because we're interested in knowing what does the North, North American monsoon have to do with any of this, and something called isothermality which is basically just a measure of how do daily temperature fluctuations compare to annual temperature fluctuations. So I had that data. And then I also was trying to answer this question about climate change. And so I took some of these climate variables. This image shows 16. I actually used 19 climate variables and they're just, it's all temperature and precipitation data. And I integrated that temperature and precipitation data with records from the Global Biodiversity Information Facility, which is known as GBIF. And this is kind of what those records look like here in this map. And um, I integrated those two data together and put them into a program called Maxent, which is used to produce species distribution models. And species distribution models basically take information about where species occur and what the climate is like at those locations to generate this map that tells you the probability of sites having suitable habitat for those species. And of course, habitat suitability is measured on this scale of zero to one, kind of color coded here on this map. So areas with uh, the green are where the, the habitat is most suitable for a given species. And areas that are really white here are areas where the habitat is not. And I, I, I use these models to, to predict both the present habitat suitability for species and also the projected habitat suitability by the year 2070 under what's called RCP 4.5. RCP 4.5 is the representative concentration pathway 4.5, which is a fancy model developed by the International Panel on Climate Change, but it's basically the most moderate scenario of climate change by 2070. And so it's kind of what we think is maybe the least extreme uh, scenario for climate change in the next 50 years. And so I use that to kind of look at, well, how is habitat suitability for these species gonna change? So 
that analysis got me to this, and I know this is an extremely daunting graph to look at, but I'll, I'll point out what's really important to see in it. Um, this is what's called canonical correspondence analysis, and it's basically showing how climatic and topographic factors are influencing these chaparral species. Now, this is something that's called an ordination. It's also called a triplot because there are sort of three things going on in this plot. You have uh, the black letters here, these codes. Those are all the transect sites that I went to. You have the letter, the red letter codes. These are the uh, eight chaparral target species that I looked at. And then these sort of blue arrows coming out from the origin of this plot are the environmental variables that I measured. Things like uh, maximum minimum temperature, the terrain wetness index and topographic position index and summer precipitation, isothermality, aspect to the north, aspect to the east, and slope, how steep slopes were. And basically this plot shows that these eight species are responding by using three different strategies. And this kind of points toward how it is that they're able to persist in these montane environments. So uh, I try to indicate that with these arrows. Strategy one is kind of limited to this um, quadrant down here is that species such as Arctostaphylos pungens and Ceanothus palsiflorus, they occur at sites with relatively high topographic position. That is, they're exposed, yet they're also receiving a lot of summer precipitation. So even though they're exposed to a lot of, of um, insulation, probably um, somewhat warm temperatures, they're, they're getting rainfall in the summertime, uh, which probably provides them some relief from those conditions. So that's one strategy. Strategy two is that species like Rhamnus alyssifolia and Rus aromatica, and maybe it's to a lesser extent, Frangula californica, they occur in sites that are warmer relatively, uh, higher maximum and higher minimum temperatures, but those sites have high terrain wetness, which means even though they're having to deal with warm temperatures all the time, they're uh, in a site that gives them access to groundwater more readily than some of these other sites. And strategy three, uh, which might have influenced things like Bercalia californica and maybe Garia flavescens and almost certainly Quercus chrysolepis, is that they simply just occur in sheltered sites, things with more north facing aspect, more east facing aspect, or things that are steeper, uh, basically re um, receiving less solar insulation, less temperature stress, and also probably sites that retain moisture better than sites that were say on a more Southern or a more Western aspect. So again, the arrows kind of point toward, you know, the, the influence of exposure and, and summer precipitation going in this direction, the influence of temperature and terrain wetness going in this direction. Of course, there's some statistics associated with this. I wouldn't worry about that right now. And this has um, already been demonstrated in a paper published by Solomon Dabrowski in 2011. And Dabrowski points toward you know, montane environments are complicated and they can, harbor, they can harbor complex climate refugia. And that's because different topographic positions in mountains uh, not only receive different amounts of solar insulation, which is illustrated on this graph on the left, where the cool colors uh, like blue are indicating sites that are not getting as much insulation as the warmer colors like the browns. So for example, site two and site four might occur at the same elevation, yet site two is on a north facing slope. So it's receiving less solar insulation, probably cooler temperatures, probably more moisture retention compared to site four. And this also relates to how air temperature is changing throughout the course of the day um, and how that relates to what the air temperature of the regional atmosphere is. And the sort of take home from this message of Dabrowski is that climate refugia um, offer sites where the conditions are different than those of the regional climate. This might be a mountain range in the Mojave Desert, but these various sites are actually gonna experience climates, microclimates that are different than the overall climate of the Mojave Desert because of these little nuanced uh, variations in their topographic position. Another thing that kind of came out of my results was this idea that uh, sclerophylla shrubs are distributed along these gradients of increasing moisture avail availability. And this uh, was illustrated in a framework published by Rundle in 1998. But um, they were talking really in general in this uh, article about uh, all Mediterranean climates, but specifically for, for my purposes, 
you can see that there's an idea that plants occur either in sort of semi-arid desert-like shrublands that are more arid and in sort of intermediate areas or where you could find evergreen sclerophyllous shrublands. And then as moisture avail availability increases, those communities transition more into sclerophyllous, sclerophyllous woodlands or even into coniferous forests, which is kind of the case um, with my results. And if it makes more sense, I'll show you this picture. We can see how shrublands intergrade into woodlands as elevation increases uh, in these mountains. And this is something that's frequently termed biotic zonation. But basically, um, you could start off with shrublands around say the 5,000 foot level that are relatively xeric. And as elevation increases, the vegetation starts to become more wooded and more and more increasingly wooded until you get into more relatively mesic habitats. And so the chaparral shrubs that occur in the Mojave Desert are found along this gradient. They're not found um, beyond it. They're not found at elevations really lower than this, and they're not found at elevations really higher than this. That's kind of interesting. Uh, I'll point toward this table here. You don't need to read all of it, but the point is that um, we can look at chaparral taxa, which are shown in red, and we can look at these sort of three characteristic plant communities that I sh just showed in those pictures. Um, and they've been previously classified by people like Barry Pridge as Joshua Tree Juniper Woodlands or Pinion Juniper Woodlands or Pine Oak Woodlands. And chaparral taxa occur in these three plant communities. But what I would point towards is that they only occur in this transition zone uh, where shrublands and woodlands meet. And this is true here in the California floristic province, right? Like you could see how there's a large belt of chaparral in between coastal sage scrub and pine forest. And something similar is going on in the Mojave. It's just that the chaparral belt in the Mojave is really small. Uh, it's limited to this extremely narrow little transition zone. Um, what does that mean? It could mean different things. It could mean that these species are released from competition in transition zones. Um, that's one idea, but either way, these sites uh, are characterized by exceptionally rich floristic diversity uh, on a regional scale because of this uh, sort of transition that's occurring. So another thing is that I looked at the ecological similarities of these mountain ranges, and uh, this suggests that isolated communities had more continuous distribution across the landscape in the past, and so these arrows kind of point toward which mountain ranges were statistically significantly similar to one another. Uh, oddly, the Clark Range was dissimilar from all the others. And my guess is that it's more characteristic of the Great Basin than it is these other mountain ranges. But maybe during the late, late Pleistocene, there was a continuous distribution of chaparral that connected the Madrean floristic, floristic province to the California floristic province over here. Um, so that's one possible consideration. The other thing is that these plant communities um, were really, really different because of the occurrence of two different species of oaks, which were the occurrence of Quercus chrysolepis in areas closer to the California floristic province and the occurrence of Quercus turbinella in areas closer to the Madrean floristic province, which is interesting. Again, uh, what, what is one of the most characteristic genera of Mediterranean-like biomes? Quercus, the genus of oaks. And while these mountain ranges here are not in a Mediterranean climate range, um, the differences between them are apparently being driven by different species of oaks. Lastly, just to look at the species distribution models, the chaparral species were generally projected to gain suitable habitat at higher elevations and higher latitudes that were on the periphery of the Mojave Desert. So this is data from Arctostaphylos pungens, the point leaf manzanita, and this is sort of the present uh, habitat suitability that I modeled. And this is the projected habitat suitability that I modeled. And you can see that the species was projected to gain considerable amounts of, of suitable habitat, but most of it not in the Mojave Desert. And we can ask questions about how realistic this is of a model. Will this play out? Just because the habitat is projected to be suitable in the future doesn't necessarily mean that the species is going to be able to disperse and establish in these sites. In contrast, 
Just because the habitat is projected to be unsuitable in a particular location doesn't mean that the species might not have some kind of adaptive capacity to evolve and remain in a stressful environment. So again, they are models, but um, they are informative. What these, uh, well, another thing that these models point towards is this question. Will shrubland ecosystems eventually come to displace woodlands in this landscape? You might notice this huge chunk of green right here. Well, that's the Sierra Nevada mountains. This is the San Bernardino mountains. These are the, um, the white Inyo and Panamint mountains. It looks like areas that we know are presently mainly dominated by conifers uh, will become uh, very, very suitable areas for shrubs to become established in the future. And we might expect that with climate change, uh, these woodland habitats will be converted into shrublands, potentially. And that's just the threat purely due to climate change. But further threats that these arid land populations could also include things like wildfire, the occurrence of invasive species, and of course, renewable energy development, which is a thing in the Mojave Desert. Uh, maybe you've heard about the 2020 dome fire. This burned um, many, many acres of SEMA dome. One of the largest continuous Joshua tree forests in the state of California was completely devastated. Um, things like Bromus rubens, this um, non-native Mediterranean grass that's very uh, aggressive and invasive is now occurring in the desert and rapidly spreading. Um, things like the development of solar panel facilities like the Ivanpah Solar Power Facility, which is right next to the New York mountains and right next to the Clark Range. You know, how might this uh, type of development start to uh, interact with the establishment of vegetation? Things like the Thule Wind Farm you may have heard of, which is sitting sort of um, on top of the Incopa Mountains in San Diego County, where actually really, really similar transition zones between desert shrublands and sort of more montane woodlands occur. How might this impact the establishment of uh, chaparral shrublands and woodlands in arid environments? These are things, all things we should think about and things that will influence the future of, of chaparral in an arid landscape. So that's my, my speech for the day. I have, of course, a whole handful of acknowledgements I won't read off, but um, you know, I, I of course have to thank my thesis committee and various CSUN faculty, other people who are interested in desert research that have uh, assisted me in the field or provided uh, comments in conversations and sources of funding. And of course, my beloved best friend, partner and fellow traveler, Sony Fuentes. So I'll be happy to take any questions now. Oh, Shane, do you want to unshare? And then there was a question from Vince um, in the chat. Hang on a second. Sorry. Uh, can you talk about the Harupa oak, Quercus palmer palmeri, being a desert species with a, a relict population? Well, Vince, you might know more about it than me. Um, oaks are interesting. I think that desert oaks are probably oaks with a more subtropical affinity and more of a subtropical evolutionary history compared to our, you know, sort of deciduous oaks. Um, I don't know much about Quercus palmeri, but you know, there are a whole, there's a whole group of various oaks that occur in the desert, not just Quercus chrysolepis, but also Quercus turbinella. Quercus John Tuckeri, Quercus Cornelius Mulleri, uh, and apparently Quercus Palmeri. I just don't know a lot about that species. I never encountered it in any of my surveys. How are the biomes determined? Are there defining characteristics or percentages that define chaparral versus de desert versus woodland? Sure. Well, I think that like anything in the biological sciences, it's, you know, humans love to put things in boxes. And sometimes we can, and sometimes our boxes work well. And sometimes boxes don't work well. And so, you know, I would, I would say that it's subjective, certainly, but I can tell you what I did and that I did not present to you because it's maybe uh, slightly 
too much to have to explain in a meeting like this, but I used clustering analyses. And these clustering analyses are um, basically using an algorithm based on a dissimil dissimilarity matrix to uh, quantify the probability of co-occurrence of species. And you can see pretty quickly in these clustering analyses that woodland taxa tend to cluster together and shrubland taxa tend to cluster together. And sometimes there's a transition cluster uh, in between the two. So st statistically speaking, you can see it that way. Uh, if you more plainly kind of wanted to see it, you can you know, go back to looking at uh, an article like the one published by Barry Pridge in 1979, where he did a floristic inventory of the New York mountains. And he kind of just looks at different areas of a particular site and says, well, you know, all these areas are kind of characterized by, you know, these 15 species. And then this next area is kind of really more characterized by these 15 or 20 species and likewise and so on. And so there are pretty clear cut patterns of, of species co-occurrence, but there's obviously a little bit of um, uh, interaction between them, a little bit of a transition between them, if that answers your question. I actually have a couple of thoughts or questions. Um, how, you know, you showed some fairly mature looking plants. Is there any, any uh, studies that have done, uh, been done that would estimate like the age of like some of those big oaks or some of the, the big uh, pine trees? And are, was there any indication that these plants are reproducing? Great question. So I am not aware of any, any demographic studies with these populations, they should be done. I would I would call upon Mojave National Preserve, although they have um, probably a very small botany crew, but that's that's something that they should be thinking about. Um, but I'm not aware of anybody having done it. Uh, if you recall that one picture I showed you of the guy standing next to the Canyon Live Oak in Carruthers Canyon in the New York Mountains, that looked like a pretty old tree. So I would guess that some of the, some of these plants probably are fairly old. Some of them probably grow pretty slowly considering the environment that they're in. Um, reproduction, great question. I did not see much evidence of chaparral taxa being reproductive. Um, like in, in other words, I did not see very many seedlings or any saplings really at all that I can think of. The pines is another story. The pines do seem to be reproducing. Um, you can go out to these places and find pine seedlings and pine saplings. And that might just be an artifact of, you know, things like Pinus monophylla. It's just, just pre-adapted to dealing with the really arid environment, whereas Crocus chrysolepis, Ramnus alicifolia, you know, they probably have a point where they can deal with aridity, but not nearly as well as Pinus monophylla. That would be my guess. Okay. Um, a couple of other questions have come in. Let me... Do we see biomes merging and transitioning with climate change? Well, I think the general trend that we should expect, let's say we had three hypothetical biomes or types of plant communities, right? And they're, they're, they're distributed along an elevational gradient, right? So one occurs lower, one occurs in the middle and one occurs higher. I think what we would expect to see with climate change is that whole sort of relationship just shifting upwards in elevation or maybe latitude. But um, I don't necessarily see them merging into each other per se, maybe on a, on a more nuanced level gradually. But overall, I think you're going to see woodland communities moving up followed by kind of intermediate shrubland woodland communities followed by shrubland communities per se particularly arid ones. Uh, another question, uh, did you look at the soils in each of your transects areas to uh, compare, contrast them? Yeah, so I uh, gave a talk to the Desert Symposium last year. You guys know who they are, um, on a group of desert-minded uh, California, not just California, but you know, Southwest desert-minded folks. And uh, I didn't quite have all this data at the time, but I had some of it. And that audience was composed almost entirely of geologists. And when the talk was over, the hands went up to answer questions, to ask questions. The very first question was, well, what about the soil? 
And I had to say, well, no, I did not look at the soil. Now, when I started doing this research, I was looking at the soil, but the problem was that along 50 meters of sampling, there's a lot of variation in the soil. So if you collect soil from one part of that survey, how, how are you saying that that's representative of the entire thing? Now you could try to subsample throughout the entire thing and that would be another approach. And then what do you do with that soil data? Do you look at you know, the, the composition of the soil? Do you look at the porosity of it? Um, there are different things you could measure. And I just decided to leave it out. And if you think back to that canonical correspondence analysis plot that I showed, I didn't really talk about the statistics behind it, but there was an amount of, of variance that was explained in the model, which was 61% of the variance. So that leaves 39% of the variance unexplained. And so you might start asking, well, what else is there to explain the variance? And almost certainly soil, soil is one such factor. Um, also in the desert symposium meeting, I talked to somebody at the National Park Service who was a geologist who had soil data. I never got a chance to implement that data, but, but data does exist that could go into these kind of models. They could kind of show like, well, how is soil also interacting with things like precipitation and terrain wetness index and topographic position and slope and all that. So I think soil is probably important. It was just kind of a little impractical to try to measure it and uh, implement it into my models. Um, Vince was pointing out that the Hurupa oak is estimated to be 13,000 years old, and it's a single clone, and it's basically the converse of a desert chaparral shrub. Just a comment, I guess. Okay. Interesting. I didn't know that uh, we had clonal oak species in, in desert environments. And here's another, I don't know if this is a comment. We can see the zones change, but what we need to research is how quickly can the plants move because climate change could happen uh, so fast for the plants, too fast for the plants to migrate. Well, that's absolutely true. And that, that heralds this concept of, of evolutionary lag. And um, evolutionary lag is very much a function of the um, generation time of a particular taxon. And these particular species that I'm looking at, their generation times are relatively long. So the amount of time it, it could take them to adapt in order to respond to climate change certainly might be insufficient. So I would agree with that. Um, their dispersability is a whole other factor. Are the dispersal vectors needed to move their, you know, their progeny into suitable habitat available? These might be things like birds and rodents. And um, I would comment that in completely other stu different studies could be done with this system using other taxa that are not plants. You could study the system using birds. You could study the system using insects and you might see those taxa responding in a similar way to, as plants. But yeah, it's, it's very true that you know, these plants just might not have the chance to, to migrate uh, at the rate that climate is changing, unfortunately. And that, this may have been true for a long, long time. And we're talking, this could have been going on for thousands of years already. Well, somebody asked about rattlesnakes. <laughs> what other, what other, I guess, what other, um, what animals are associated with these highly isolated environments, these relic environments? Well, I didn't spend a lot of time studying the animals, but I mean, that information is, you know, it's been documented in, in books like that book I first talked about, about the Mojave National Preserve and other kinds of field guides and resources like iNaturalist. You know, typical Highland Mojave um, mammals that you could find. Um, I did do a study on the bird species there in 2016 in the New York mountains. And I will comment that, again, a very similar trend as seen with plants can be seen with birds. And so you can go out and survey birds in the Mojave lowlands and you're gonna find you know, things like loggerhead shrikes and white crowned sparrows and phanopepla, whatever. If you travel up to the higher elevations above say you know, 5,500 feet or 6,000 feet, all of a sudden the bird community changes. You might start finding things like blackhead grosbeaks, uh, spotted tuis, uh, things like the woodhouse scrub jay, for example, uh, vireos, bush tits. 
all these bird species that are completely uncharacteristic of the desert occur in these desert mountains. And again, these are bird species characteristic of distant regions, species characteristic of sort of Rocky Mountain Great Basin region, species characteristic of more of the California floristic province, species characteristic maybe more of this, you know, mountains of the Sonoran Desert. So um, there are some interesting patterns to be seen with the birds. And again, I'll comment that Entomology is sort of underrepresented branch of the biological sciences, but I think that if somebody went out to these desert mountains and spent some time studying the insects of the higher elevation plant communities, they might find some similar interesting trends and they might even find undescribed species. So, I mean, that's, that's kind of my comment on the animal life. I didn't see any rattlesnakes to answer that, that question. <laughs> to guard that's against surprising. them. That's really surprising. <laughs> yeah, I wonder if it had to do with the time of year that I was there, the time of day that I was surveying. But okay. I never did see any. Well, I think that was, we covered the questions in the chat. Um, is there anybody else that wants to ask a question in person? Um, I don't see anybody. Um, Thanks so much, Shane. Uh, this has been really, really interesting. A beautiful presentation. Um, when is, oh, did you find Joshua trees as somebody asked, but I think you showed a Josh, Joshua tree. Yes. So Joshua trees is a whole other interesting story. Um, I found them, of course, in the New York mountains. They're around the Clark range, but not in any areas where the chaparral taxa occur. Uh, you saw the picture in the San Bernardino Mountains. You may or may not know that it's kind of, we're kind of on the cusp of there being two Joshua tree species now that are that are sort of formally described, the Western Joshua tree, Yucca brevifolia, and the Eastern Joshua tree, Yucca jaegerensis, which is named for uh, Edmund Jaeger, who was a great uh, California desert botanist. And those two species are kind of morphologically distinct. And they each have, uh, different obligate moth pollinators. So two different species of moth that pollinate either of the Western or Eastern Joshua trees. Um, so that's kind of interesting, but Joshua trees really, they kind of occur in this plant community that's just below that point where you start to encounter chaparral as I was showing. So they don't really tend to co-occur much with the chaparral. Okay. At least in the sites I went to. Okay. You would have seen them, I'm sure. They're pretty, pretty distinctive. Well, I saw SEMA dome. I saw the, the aftermath of the dome fire. It's sad. It was pretty sad. You know, uh, I've um, spent a lot of time in the Western Mojave and, uh, and I have seen fire recovery from burnt um, Joshua trees in that in that environment, but it took years for the for the plant to re-sprout from the roots. Mm -hmm. So I know it does happen, but that's in the Western Mojave. And I'm I'm not that familiar with Eastern Mojave Joshua trees and how they how they recover from fire. Yeah. Well it's a, it's a different climate. It's sort of a bi biotically it's sort of a different environment as I sort of explained. So we will see. I'm, I'm sure Mojave National Preserve is keeping their eye on the on the dome yeah, fire. It'd be interesting to see if if any of those um, trees that were burned uh, sprout from, right. the, from the roots. All right, Shane. I'm going to close off the uh, the program with many many thanks for for your stimulating discussion. I I'm assuming you're finishing up with your master's degree. Is that correct? That's correct. I will have a thesis defense on April 24th. Oh, okay. And uh, look uh -huh. for a publication because I think my, my thesis will probably be submitted to one of our more local Southwest journals, like maybe Madronia or something like that. That would be wonderful. Please, please share that information with us. Absolutely. Put that out there. All right. Yes. Good luck with your thesis de defense. Good evening, people. Thanks so, so much for attending. Hope to see you at another meeting and uh, at some hikes and field trips.
things are blooming, you know, to get your butts out there and start looking at some, some blooming wildflowers before they all dry up. Take care. Thanks, Noni. Thank, Thank you. Everybody.